The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. All right, joining us now to discuss all this crypto market activity is Alex Thorne, head of research at Galaxy Digital. Hi there, Alex. Great to have you on the show. So do you see Bitcoin hitting that all time high potentially today? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Um, there's been a lot of uh, market forces pushing Bitcoin up. It's not just the ETF, by the way, although I absolutely agree that's been a bullish um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, a bullish force on, on the market. But yeah, I mean, we were, I was hoping to see it yesterday, but um, still just really happy that the market has uh, matured to the point where you have such a diverse uh, range of options to gain exposure to Bitcoin, whether it's, you know, lifeboat freedom money that you keep on a hardware wallet or uh, something that you can keep in well, your Well, Alex, you account. say it's not just the uh, pro shares Bitcoin's futures ETF. Then what is it? I, and uh, Lawrence alluded yeah. to stable coins uh, and the markets in Asia as giving it a boost. Well, one thing we noticed, we put out a report yesterday, 10 things that show crypto is booming. And, and one of the things we've been watching is five-year break-even yields. Uh, Bitcoin's been running almost in tandem, almost at a perfect correlation with the inflation expectations for about 30 days. Um, we see it as operating almost as a gold-like uh, uh, instrument in the market that still serves as a risk asset. So at the same time as this correlation appeared, um, we saw the NASDAQ and the S&P um, also start to rebound and, and are just slightly off their all-time highs now as well. So you're sort of in a risk-on environment with, a, with an inflation expectation. Uh, gold has been floundering, and yet Bitcoin has been moving directly in lockstep with inflation expectations. So it's kind of a perfect storm for Bitcoin, I think, as a macro asset right now. Hey, Alex, yesterday was day one and it was the first ETF. We have a whole bunch coming up this week. Uh, what do you think What do you think will happen there? How will those guys do? Honestly, it's hard to know. First, the first movers clearly has a lot of hype. There's obviously a ton of demand. You guys pointed out that Bloomberg reported this was the second largest uh, ETF debut uh, in history. It may even be the first by some measures. Um, look, I think just more more people um, with more options and, and competition in a market is always good. Um, so one of the reports I've seen is like that there's been a lot of this interest in the futures ETF has come from retail investors. But I guess maybe it would be interesting if you could spell out for me this kind of narrative that, um, OK, it's so much easier to get into a Bitcoin futures ETF than like set up and set up an account at like Coinbase or Kraken. I don't really totally mm. get that. Like, why? Why is it so much easier to, to get into this ETF than it would be just to, to trade crypto normally? Um, can you just spell that out? Because it's a little bit bewildering to me. Yeah, I mean, I think for a sophisticated young retail investor, it's not difficult to gain access to Bitcoin or cryptocurrency exposure today through um, crypto exchanges and other platforms that already exist. But for the large swaths of investment advisors and, and retail users who um, don't have experience outside of their existing brokerage platforms, um, and also for those who want to own instruments like this inside RAAs, uh, sorry, excuse me, IRA accounts, so retirement accounts, um, I think this is a, still a huge, uh, uh, a great option for them. Um, it's, you know, I, I think we'll see more market access vehicles like this that, that, I just I, I'm in awe of the range of, of methods we have now to gain access just a couple years ago. Right. During the, I was thinking back to 2017, um, there was a few onshore exchanges, right? Just a couple that you could really access. Almost no market infrastructure, no connectivity to the traditional financial world. And today you have literally on the New York Stock Exchange down the street from me here in New York, um, a Bitcoin ETF trading uh, makes it very easy for people to access. So just to pivot slightly, talking about things that are easy for people to access, it, I, I understand that you have some knowledge of um, meme coins, um, specifically Sheepcoin. Um, I know that you've written about Dogecoin before, but Sheepcoin is now, you know, this really hot coin that um, people, many people take even less seriously than, than Doge. But can you just explain a little bit the phenomenon behind this? Um, you know, someone told me that for people in China, for example, a lot of people, this is the first coin they buy. Like, what, what, what's going on here? Like, is this, is, is there anything really behind behind Sheepcoin? Why are, um, what, does it have legs? I, I mean, so to speak, like what, <laughs> what, um, yeah, I mean, just anything you could tell look, us about this. I, I don't bet in this market in particular, I don't bet against, um, you know, funny meme coins. And I think Dogecoin really is that like dog themed token, uh, to rule the world. So, but the thing about Sheep that I think is interesting, um, if anything, is that you can, you know, you can access DeFi with Sheep. Um, you know, Dogecoin is on its own proof of work chain. It's not really well represented in um, DeFi ecosystems, but with something like Sheeb, 
um, if you're interested in it and you're, you know, operating on chain, you can, you can, um, there's a lot, a lot you can do with it that you can't do with the Dogecoin. But in general, I think these meme, the meme coins are really sort of a sign of the, the beauty of community on the internet in a lot of ways. Um, you've got, uh, we now have these financial methods to, um, and, and make our own money methods to express our community with each other. And that, that yields some pretty funny things. And, and to me, I don't read too much past it beyond that. You know, when you wrote that Dogecoin report in May, it was quite, uh, you know, in depth in terms of, you know, talking about the team. It was created as a joke. Uh, the supply scale was uh, was on, was forever. And yeah. I, I wonder, when comparing that with Sheeb, do, do you have an understanding of, you know, what is the team behind them? What 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 is the supply there? Is it, and why do we need another Shiba Inu themed coin? I, I'm not sure that we do. We haven't done, to be clear, a deep analysis <laughs> of Shiba Inu coin. Um, and because it, you know, it, it, it doesn't have its own blockchain, a lot of that analysis is going to not be relevant in that comparison. The stuff we did about Doge, I think the most salient information we pulled was about the resilience of the blockchain itself and nodes on the network. Um, you know, I think Shib to me is, is another token and you can spin these things up like crazy and, um, look, I mean, you can build a community around it. I mean, that's really how I view this almost exclusively is, you know, we could create Alex token if enough people like it, like who knows, I, would I be surprised? I don't know. I, Shib, Shiba Inus are great dogs. You know, Alex, you say that we don't need another dog theme thing, uh, uh, coin, but I can tell you this, a Shih Tzu coin would do really well with the Entas at the Mahjong <laughs> table. So, um, you know, just beware that that could be next. Uh, it, one of the charts you had was a, a Bitcoin dominance chart uh, showing that Bitcoin's dominance has actually risen over the past few weeks. Is that, does that tell us that the peak it, it, in, uh, in, in the alts and things like meme coins, is that behind us now with Bitcoin taking dominance? It's a good question. It is kind of what what I think in the near term. Um, I wouldn't say the peak is behind us, but these things are so cyclical. We know that um, you know Bitcoin pri its previous all time high was in April, and then ETH was shortly thereafter, and then we sort of went through a period where DeFi ran really well, and then NFTs, and then all layer ones, and folks were you know active traders were sort of cycling um, and rotating their profile their their portfolios there and we knew that a few weeks ago we started to see that that some investors were telling us that they were structurally underweight bitcoin right and so i think that's where you start to see um you know with bitcoin like i said tracking inflation expectations moving up over the last 30 days you can also see i think it retaking some market share when you look at the market uh dominance the the bitcoin dominance chart and so I do think it's likely that, if, you know, this fall feels like a Bitcoin fall to me. I mean, like all of these bull runs in crypto, there'll be probably more rotations. Um, but but Bitcoin, it feels like all hail the king right now with Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say Shibas are nice dogs. My understanding of them is that they're quite cute, but then they can be very difficult once you bring them home. So I don't know if there's like a <laughs> metaphor there. But anyway, um, oh. that's a topic for another show. <laughs> um, <laughs> just back to the back to Bitcoin for a second. Um, so, you know, one of the well, there are some critics of this this ETF. Right. And one of the criticisms out there is that, you know, people aren't actually buying Bitcoin itself. They're buying futures contracts. And could this in a strange way actually like cause like bring some people who would have gotten into the spot market out of the market and into the futures market. Do you see what I'm saying? So like right now the price yeah. rise is very much tied to this like narrative and to this like, you know, symbolism, but over the long term, like, is it actually good for Bitcoin? There are some people out there who think that it's maybe not. Yeah. I mean, I look, I think it definitely is good for Bitcoin to be clear. I'm on that side, uh, net overall positive, mostly because you have many ways to express your interest in this asset. And like I said, you know, I can use a, a cold, an off, an off um, a self custody multi sig setup that I set up for my own Bitcoin, right? Where you can't ever get any of it. But I, you know, I also have these other accounts. There might want you might want ways to 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 express it. We'd love to see a range of competitive fund products that have different structures. I think everyone would, and I think we will. So, I mean, in terms of you know a, a cash settled future uh, futures based ETF, you know there there are pros and cons and, and interesting things about this vehicle, like there are others. But I think it's very clear that people just want exposure. We're going to see a lot of interest. And I don't think this dampens interest for, you know, actual Bitcoin. 
Um, I think it's more, you know, I think people who know and more people than ever before and a growing number of people worldwide know about Bitcoin, really know about it. A lot of them want to own real Bitcoin and, and, mm -hmm. and, and store, learn about things like running their own node and self custody. But there's plenty of those same people also want these other vehicles, right? And, and let alone all the others. I wonder what is behind SEC Chair Gary Gensler's hesitancy to approve a Bitcoin spot ETF or is a physical Bitcoin ETF on the horizon? Well, it's hard to know exactly the timing, any kind of timing. I'm still confident that we'll see one eventually. It's, it's. I think part of um, Chairman Gensler, and this is what he said, was that because you know the futures are, are carried on CME, which is has a clear regulatory regime, that I think that's where their comfort level comes from. You look at the other, um, you know, actions that he's taken and some of the proposals that have been made. Um, they he clearly thinks that the cryptocurrency exchange market needs additional regulation, and perhaps that's a reason for the delay, but I can't speculate beyond that. Does he need more authority to request more oversight from Congress? That's what he's asked for. Um, okay. You know, I, I don't know if he does or not, and I don't want to comment too much on, on, on this, but um, if, if you go back and review the record, um, you know, he's been in discussions with U.S. senators, right, both mm -hmm. via letter and correspondence, but also in appearances before the Senate um, discussing this.